the network. Wow, what's up everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and this is Inside the Network. It's our exclusive series where we show you exclusive content interviews and artist sessions from inside of brandmannetwork.com. And this one is one of three initial interviews we decided to show you from inside the network. DJ Payne One, this guy right here. Man, like if you haven't, if you don't know who he is, first of all, you probably just aren't on the internet right now because this guy's he's moving. He has his own YouTube page, just killing it in its own right, doing his thing on Instagram. And just the impact he's making in the music producer community really can't be measured at this point. Right. He's also a co-owner of Music Entrepreneurship Club. Obviously, is what it sounds like. Right. They, they, it's about music entrepreneurship and once again, this guy has his own track record. I'm talking about working with Young Jeezy, uh, Lil Baby, Rick Ross, so many other people when we're looking at these placements. So I'm not going to go too much further into what he's done, but just know you'll get a lot of dope insights from the interview. Let's get into it. And he's going to be a wealth of knowledge. I already know. I, like, I'm just excited to talk to him myself. So let me go ahead and get into these questions. DJ Payne One, welcome. What's up, man? Appreciate you having me on. Don't set the bar too high, though. Let's let's be realistic here. <laughs> hey, man, you give just about as you know you give as much knowledge as anybody these days. But all right, I get, I got it. Set the bar low and shock them. I got you. All right, let, let me let me start here because I'm interested and I don't know this. How did you personally get started? I always got to like set that tone just to give me a feel. With with production or with the entrepreneurial side of it all. Nah, production. Uh, I was just a kid. You know, kids are curious. I loved hip hop always on a on a musical level, on a, but also on a deeper cultural level, for years and years and years. So it was just that I was bored. I haven't been bored for over a decade now. Now that I'm doing what I'm doing, but <laughs> back then there was you know boredom was a, a close friend of mine. So age 14 i'm like you know what i'm just gonna make two crazy decisions i'm gonna start writing graffiti and i'm gonna start making beats because because oh, hip-hop so i did I, that's what i did for years you talking about for I'm real still making, yeah yeah i'm still making beats not not breaking the law anymore <laughs> dope man i mean i've seen Real quick question, just because it's random and I thought about it. You, I saw in your discography that you got a chance to um, do a beat for Public Enemy. How was that? I, I worked with them a lot. Shout out to Chuck Z. Um, I worked on at least three of their albums and then plus a couple records for Chuck as well. And then for Jaggy too, who's uh, PE 2.0. So I feel like I'm kind of yeah embedded in that world right now. I didn't realize it was that serious, man. I only asked because they're, you know, you have legends and then you have like legend legends. Right, you know, Chuck well, D is a legend legend. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, of course, a lot of people might not know them these days, but like, yeah, what was it like working with them personally? You know what I mean? That's all I got. It's just a selfish question. <laughs> I mean, that's, that was my favorite hip hop group growing up. So mm. the, the fact that it even happened in another dimension where I'm, where I'm 11 years old, I'm, I'm my head is exploding. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> Got you. All right. Well, like you, you, you hopped in the hip hop just out of, you know, boredom and it sounds like you just navigated your way through. And like, if you fast forward, you're at a point where just like I mentioned, you're like you're, you've done all this stuff placement wise. Right. But then you're also be leasing beats online. All right. And that's you're one of the few people I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people, but you're just one of the few people that I know who are doing both sides of those, like without necessarily, you know, trying to hide it or anything. I mean, it's just a both. It, it, you seem to do them fluidly with no with no problem. How do you feel about that argument that I'm always hearing? Uh, Well, let me just go back. I got distracted by something I said. I wasn't so bored that I just wanted to do hip hop. I've been trying to, I remember when I was five, I wanted to be a DJ and a graffiti writer. So it was just like, suddenly I, I was bored enough to have that internal dialogue 
as deeply as it can be when you're 13, 14 years old. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do it. But, uh, but yeah, um, sorry, the question was internet versus industry. Yeah. I mean, just, just the fact that you're doing both and, you know, just like the way well, is known that there are some producers who are obviously on the industry side that have pages, but are hiding it, you know, hiding their identity and things like that. And there's reasons why I get it. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I wonder how that I've never met one personally. Yeah. You know, I just major seven called me yesterday. Shout out to him. And he, he wants to, um, to kind of transition into that world, but his mentor is mantra. So, and mantra's, I think the top selling internet producer. So it seems like it's just happening right out in the open static selected, for example, um, a lot, a lot of people, it's funny too, because a lot of people contact me and 10, eight, five years ago, if you would ask me, Hey, should I sell uh, beat licenses on the internet? I would have said, no, don't do it. And now I'm kind of the guy that, that some people contact and say, Hey, you know, what, what, what's the real inside scoop with this? Um, and now I'm saying, yeah, I, I think it's a, a great outlet for, for beats. It's a great opportunity to work with unsigned artists. It's a, it's a great um revenue stream uh but i you know like like curtis king said it's it, he didn't say this exactly but he kind of implied it there's a lot of gray area between the internet and the industry and ironically for me this year some placements including wiz khalifa that came through my friendship with a producer who's for all intents and purposes probably considered an internet producer who's dream life and then also um I've, I've been doing static selector forever but that came around full circle when he joined beat stars and i interviewed him and we reconnected mm. interesting <clears throat> now you said something there i don't want to like skip over it you said five years ago you would have said nah i don't do it but what yeah, changes I mean, a lot of mistakes uh just you know you're you're ignorant until you choose to not be ignorant anymore <laughs> and if you if you are presented with a, a a a fact or two that challenges your ignorance and you still choose ignorance then you're stupid i didn't want to be stupid but i damn sure was ignorant and you just kind of have this or I, I'll speak for myself. I kind of had this mentality when I was working for placements that because it was so damn hard just to get a placement that I wanted to, I guess, feel like I was working harder than everyone else. And like my work had more value and far too much value to license mm. for twenty four ninety nine on the internet to anybody, right? But... <laughs> <laughs> when I say it out loud, this is really what I was feeling. When I say it out loud, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Because in the meantime, there were artists who were getting beats online that, that are now great artists, you know, huge artists that I, that I would have killed to work for back then. There are producers who were building up their brands on the internet and, and, and generating income at the time that I would have never dreamed of generating doing what i was doing chasing placements so it was it was just really stupid of me to create that psychological line between what was happening on the internet and, and what i was doing and, and it just it, it was ignorance it was ignorance and it wasn't until people who i respected started giving me more insight into um let me close this window into what the the internet beat licensing space was all about and then i started and even that that only brought me in and then i had to meet people like beat demons and, and, and uh dylan graham and um the crates and, and dream life for it to become real to me where i could actually ask this person questions about that world and you know they're they're so forthcoming They'll, they'll pull their phones out right now and say, here's the sales report. Look, I just made $1,700 in the last two days. Oh. I'm like, wow, you did this independently and you don't have to chase labels and you don't have to get <laughs> a, you know, a lawyer 
every time you upload a beat and you don't have to wait for a check for six months. Yeah. How could I? How could I be mad at that? One hundred percent. I get that. Um, that that more corporate side of things, or just industry side of things, just the the, the politics alone, the movements alone is is enough to drain you. So I, it just it, works differently. They want you to work fast, and they want you to wait to get paid, and that's just <laughs> that's the nature of the business. The, the advances come late. The royalties come quarterly, but there's always a lag time. Um, you send the beat. I've had placements take five years to even come up. Mm. So, so from a creative side, it's frustrating. You know, I, I, if I and 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 that's why now I'm so much more relaxed because if I make a beat that I really love and want people to hear, which is kind of the point of making art, in my opinion, I can just put it out and there's a platform for that and there's a there's a, a base of listeners for that whether it's other producers that just want to listen to it and give me um, feedback or whether it's recording artists that want to license that beat and, and you know put money in my pocket god bless them there's an outlet mm. and no. i can and i control that i don't have to wait for somebody else to tell me yes it's cool you can you can upload this beat now got you now so producers are interesting because you just talked about like playing for other producers to get feedback and things like that like what, what makes producers so collaborative in a way where artists aren't and do you think artists like that culture would ever change with artists where they'll be so you know sharing with each other to create things at scale i think a better question is will producers ever be at each other's necks the way artists are and I, and I hate to be pessimistic, but I just think that, that producers are kind of experiencing a renaissance where not, just now we're getting a piece of the spotlight. Mm. Whereas 10 years ago, nobody knew who producers were really. I mean, unless they rapped, unless they put their, you know, people knew who Timberland was, people knew who Dre was, but they were the exception and they didn't just stick to, to producing records or making beats. Nowadays, Murder Beats doesn't rap. People know who he is, though. Metro Boomin doesn't rap. People know who he is, though. Suddenly, the producer is a Marshmallow doesn't sing. Mar you know what I mean? And these are superstars. Yeah. And, and so things are, are different for producers now. Suddenly, we have the limelight. Things are going well. But I'm seeing kind of hints of of negative patterns emerging, you know, just with, with kind of public feuds and, and stupid stuff that can just get handled as adults, because we're all adults. And even if we're not adults, that's not really an excuse for acting uh, immaturely in the public space. So my hope is that that's not what happens. My hope is that we look at, at our successes and, and where we stand as a collective community and say, okay, this is good. Let's make it better but by respecting each other and by maintaining this collaborative culture rather than moving backwards and i and i interviewed an hour ago i interviewed um jd on the track and then the, the week prior i interviewed uh iceberg beats and they both collabed on that polo g record pop out which is a huge hit right now and i just discovered that today actually i saw an ad what yeah so but i mean this is one of the, the the songs of the summer and they collaborated on it and so I wanted to tell that story and kind of emphasize the benefit of collaboration in, in, the, in the producer community because there is this kind of paranoia and fear because every now and then something negative will happen. But it, it's our decision to make. Do we, do we allow our, our decision, our collective decisions and our collective philosophies on collaboration to be defined by the couple negative experiences or do we correct the negative experiences, address them, and, and move forward with the benefits of collaboration guiding us? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I can see what you mean by the additional spotlight coming could at some point create some of that energy um, or add to that energy, obviously. Just because, I mean, when, I, when you think about an artist, producing and collab well collaborating with each other especially if only one of them ends up performing 
right? They get a lot of the credit and that's how consumers look at credit. So maybe when you start to get into that side of things, who gets credit for stuff like that, maybe it'll get weird, but it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic or maybe even a weird analogy, but I kind of think about like segregation theory when you said what you said, like, because it's like when you're separated, it's easy to stay together when you're not, you know, getting the credit or when you're not allowed certain rights. And then once you assimilate, then you kind of take on some of those other problems that you wouldn't have experienced otherwise. So that's interesting. Well, also, I mean, it's, what we do is 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 uh, competitive too, but we can be competitors and respect each other at the same time and want to see each other win. You know, we're always competing. Uh, I think in rap, there was definitely always competition in hip hop period. That's what it was kind of based yeah. on culturally. It was there were always battles, whether it was breakers, whether it was DJs, whether it was rappers, whether it was graffiti artists, and there were always, you know, the the kind of the purpose was to do it in a positive way, but there yep. were always those moments where where negativity would find its way in, and I get it, it happens. Um, I just don't want that to be the norm. Obviously, none of us want that to be the norm. There there are moments in history where it became really ugly. Obviously, losing two great MCs. In, in that kind of uh, competition gone wrong. But there, I think there's a lot more to that story than, than just, you know, rap beef. That being said, seeing those kinds of examples should make us want to be a little more careful about what we do and, and, and how we move and how we treat each other. But we're humans at the end of the day, we make decisions. I just hope we make the right decisions. And, you know, five, five, 10 years ago, no one would care if, I went online and, and said something negative about Curtis King or lifestyle or whoever. Nowadays, <laughs> you know, like I'll joke with people on Twitter, you know, just roast each other because because I'm not sensitive like that. I'm sensitive in other ways, but people take it too serious. I'm just like, come on, man. <laughs> Why? Our heads shouldn't automatically go there. You know, we 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 don't need this this public beef just because people are paying attention just because some people are attracted to negativity that shouldn't be the basis of our branding it's the, the attention man that's what makes a lot of things go wrong right once people are watching it's like oh that ego gets involved <laughs> yeah exactly and then social media mm -hmm. i mean th thank god we didn't have social media when hip-hop first started i couldn't even imagine what that would have been like like yeah. You had mentioned something earlier when you basically talked about that psychological line that you you had drawn in your head when you were saying, nah, I'm not going to do this online be selling thing. Is there anything that you see with artists or producers um, that like that when they're trying to work their way up, There's is there any kind of commonality that you see in terms of like some psychological lines that they have drawn that are holding them back? Oh my God. Yeah. There are a million. I think all of the lines that are holding the back are psychological. Uh, one big one is thinking that you already need some kind of insane budget, some kind of crazy industry support mm. to, to create a career for yourself. Um, that, I mean, thinking there's no middle ground thinking it's either you you're, you're failing or you're, you're winning on this grand scale, that's a terrible way to think. Uh, and you have, I, I've had conversations with people that say, you know, if you don't get signed, what's the point? Uh, well, <laughs> you could make a living doing what you love. Isn't that kind of cool? You can do that without being signed. You can have <laughs> touch, if you're not touching tens of, of, of millions of people's lives, you can touch 10,000 people's lives and mm. that's your livelihood. Doesn't that sound good to you? Um, so that's a, that's a psychological barrier. There's just a lot, you know, and you can see it in the way certain people move. Um, I think the other major psychological barrier is just not wanting to, or not understanding that this is a, a long game and this is, we should know the whole marathon concept by now. Oh. Uh, and we say it, but some of us don't actually embody that because we want it now which is the reason I got 10 producers every day in my inbox trying to sell me beats. And then when I say, uh, take me off this list, I'm a producer. Oh, okay, fam. I'm just trying to hustle any way I can. 
or or why are you in your feelings um <laughs> I'm, ju- I'm just doing what everybody's doing yeah because well number one that's not true and, and number two is because you want it now you want me to buy a beat you want me to put money in your pocket but you don't want to take the time that that it requires to build a, some kind of trust a, to the point where people feel comfortable spending their money with you mm. that's not something we need to take lightly and people get so for all all artists these days with the internet they they apply that instant gratification concept that the internet is so good at instilling in our in our brains they they apply that to their long-term music careers okay if you do that you're going to fail sorry but that's your choice. You either look around and, and see people like Tech Nine and see people like Macklemore, or whoever, and, and and you see, well, oh, they got famous overnight. Well, no, they didn't. <laughs> Go back. They've been doing this for for years and years and years. But that's your choice to see it on the surface level. Mm. And if you see it on the surface level, of course, everything's gonna look like like instant gratification and somebody who actually has experience in the game will come along and tell you it's different and, and, and you have it wrong. And then um, a lot of the times, unfortunately, people will lash out at them as haters or lash out at them as, as discouragers rather than people who are trying to give you a reality check. So mm. it's all mental. How do you pace yourself? Speaking of the marathon. Uh I'm bad at pacing myself. I'm I'm trying to work and do 20 different things at once, but setting smaller goals, um, goals that, that have an impact. So it's not like I want, I want to make a hundred followers every day. That's kind of stupid ass goal because what did those followers mean? Um, I want to, I want to set some meaningful goals. If the, if the meaningful goal is, uh, pay all of my bills off with passive income, well, that projects a, a series of tests that I need to implement and, and complete in order for that goal to be met. So I know exactly what I need to do for that to happen. And guess what? If I don't know what I need to do, then I know exactly what I need to do to research. I know exactly what I need to research and focus on in order to figure out how to make that happen. So those are the kinds of goals. It's not like like 15 years ago, or like, okay, 10 years ago when I was really um, chasing the placements and, and thinking okay i need a, a million dollar publishing deal i mean and that's what i was thinking I need a million dollar publishing deal otherwise it's just not going to work for me now i'm looking at it like well wait let me just get my foundational my, my financial foundation to a point where i can focus on the next step rather than trying mm. to jump up to to because you know and it could happen i'm not saying that overnight not necessarily overnight success, but, but life change can change overnight. I mean, right. If I accidentally get a hit record tomorrow, yeah, my life's going to change, but I can't plan for that kind of stuff. I can plan for what I can control. So, so setting those smaller goals that are are within the realm of possibility based on what I can do for myself. Cause at the end of the day, it's just me working for myself. So what can I do? You know what I mean? I can, I think a lot of people plan for, cosigns they plan for placements they they plan for for deals and mm. uh, you can't you can't set plans based on the actions of other people that haven't happened yet all right so like stuff out of your control mm-hmm. got it okay that's interesting so do you read a lot of books yeah i mean I, i'm yeah i'm a nerd i read books what what are some books you recommend? I was, you were saying some things that just remind me of like concepts that I hear a lot. I I was wondering if there's anything that you recommend. I read mostly novels. <laughs> so oh mostly, really? Yeah, I, I don't have any. You know, and I need. To, I I talk to people all the time. They're like, yeah, you got to check out such and such marketing expert, such and such wealth building expert. I'm like I've never heard of these people and. <laughs> and I'm probably selling myself short by by not um, doing doing that research. Got you. Got you. Okay. Well, you talked about your, the fact that you were, I mean, like you're, you're doing your thing and you said at the end of the day, it's just you. Like, what's the difference between, like, do you consider yourself a, like a music entrepreneur at this time? At this point, yeah. 
to, okay even cool. when i was and i didn't you know i didn't consider myself that i still was got you so that's what that's what i want to know like what do you feel like the difference is between like being now that you like truly consider yourself one right like what's the difference between this and maybe even when you just thought you were again it, you know it's mental now that I consider myself one, I have to implement um, certain. Well, okay, so when I first started, and I wasn't calling myself a, a music entrepreneur, I would consider myself a, a producer who was trying to become a professional producer, which I guess you could say are the, are the same thing. Um, I had to impose some kind of schedule on myself because suddenly I was I was transitioning out of having a traditional job. Traditional jobs tell you you got to show up at this time and you can leave at this time. With all right, music, right. All, all the people around me, all of my music people around me, when they quit their job, they didn't know what the hell to do because suddenly they had all this freedom and they just lost their minds and, and didn't do anything. Yeah. So for me, it was important for me to actually the same way I showed up for work was to show up for my music career. So mm. that, that was kind of the first step for me. And then nowadays, obviously that habit of showing up is still incredibly important, but I've added way more daily tasks to that schedule uh, because right. I've just learned about different revenue streams. Back then I was just focusing on one. Now I'm focusing on like 12. Uh, so that's changed. Content creation, like we were have, uh, talking about before the, the camera started rolling, same situation. Uh, you know, it's a more deliberate focus. It's not just that we suddenly have content accidentally every other month. And oh yeah, sure. I'll upload this at a certain time. Now we're on a schedule and we know we, we have people yeah. that are relying on us to, to drop content at certain times. And right. so that level of consistency and that level of structure helps us as creators because we know what we need to do and then it helps the people that uh that support our content got it it's always good to hear people talk about how creatives need structure because so many people are anti-structure and i always try to really point, push that point through that you know creativity can't really be channeled without a structure to channel it through no, nah, that's a hell of a conversation too. Because I I posted something on MEC talking about this. What was it? I I, I was talking about the the beat a day challenge and and how finishing beats helped me. And it was like, oh, you you just probably made a whole bunch of trash beats. You can't force the process. I'm like, yes, I can. I did. <laughs> and did I make trash beats? Yes, I did. But the lesson in that was I had to build a habit to complete my tracks so that I could build up a catalog so I could step into the professional arena and. And compete and actually be viable i can't be viable with five finished beats and a thousand unfinished beats you know what i'm saying mm. so once i got in the habit of finishing beats then i just have to focus on the next thing which is increasing my uh musicality programming better drums as long as i have the foundation of seeing a task through then i can improve how i i create that task so it's just it's it's one of those frustrating conversations because artists are just frustrating, man. We're we're we are so difficult and so stubborn and irrational, and that's why that's why I think and sometimes it's like the more irrational and frustrating an artist is, the better their art is. Because I've worked with artists too. I'm like, you're so talented. Why are you so resistant <laughs> to doing the things that are gonna help get your art to the people who need it? That you could have a livelihood right now. Why are you messing around doing all this other stupid stuff and fighting with all the people that are trying to help you and structure your life? <sighs> yeah, so it's it's difficult. Um, I mean, and as an artist, I reckon I talk to Dame all the time. I know I piss Dame off all the time because he's so far over on the business side of the the music entrepreneurship spectrum. Yeah. Whereas Kind of like I'm either in super creative mode or super entrepreneur mode. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and I saw him the other day. He came out here for a conference, and um, he's like, "I know I pay, piss you off." And like, you know, Dame, it's probably that I annoy you a lot more than you annoy me because I understand both sides. Yeah. And I know when I'm doing. I know when my my artist side is is unchecked, and 
All right, pardon the interruption for a quick commercial break because again, this series is brought to you by brandmannetwork.com. And of course you probably recognize that name and that's because we signed ourselves that same mentality we preach. It's something that we also practice because it allows us to control and actually be able to not have to dilute certain information that other people would not want us to put out. Now, with that in mind, just to make it clear what brandmannetwork.com is. It's a space that's all about progress, all about action. This is not some kind of space where artists just go take in courses for entertainment or anything like that. We leave that to YouTube for those people who aren't serious. This is a specific space for people who are dedicated to progress in their career and building their own systems and their own team where they don't necessarily have to wait for a record deal or they don't even have to wait to find a manager, right? We're seeing artists in four months make more progress than they've made in two years of just taking in this random research on YouTube or Google or all these videos that pop up on Instagram because it's not about the inspiration in here, it's about the progress. So we're an artist development platform where we get your brand right, your content right, and we also help you build a marketing plan, a custom plan to you to actually make progress. Keep that in mind and let's get back to the interview. It's the network. <laughs> I don't know how to help it. Yeah. That's, that's it. That's um, that's interesting what you talked about as far as you creating beats and then improving them because that's that's the idea that you don't have to sacrifice, right? You can, you can have quantity and quality, but yeah. it's just reps, right? You you get good at what you train for, you know. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of that simple. No, that's a good metaphor because some because because the, the people saying no, you got to make quality all the time. That's like saying every time you do a rep and leave the gym you got to get another inch on your bicep. It's just not, it doesn't work that way. That mm. happens over time. I, mm. I, some people have natural raw talent, but that doesn't mean that your final product is going to be ready. Mm. Got you. Yes. So it's, a, it's just a refinement thing. Interesting yeah, to exactly. think about it that way. It's like if, uh, you know, of course, all those shots that Steph Curry shoots at a distance, I don't know if you watch basketball, but like traditionally those are bad shots but obviously he trained so well and so much at shooting those, right? That it's not a bad shot for him. But most people stayed in the box of that's a bad shot, so I'm not gonna even shoot it or even try to get good at that. I mean, I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm all for the for stuff right now. Cause they be rapid. <laughs> Got you. Cool, like I'm interested, like you've done, you know, quite a bit. You're not the most famous producer in the world, but you are, like very accomplished in your own right. Like what like do you want out of this industry still? Um, I'm at the point where I just want to be happy, which for me involves having the freedom to make music that, that I enjoy and that other people enjoy and not feeling the, the financial pressures that most artists feel. I don't think anyone mm -hmm. can be happy with, with someone's foot on their back. You know what I mean? So yeah that that to me is just yeah i just want to focus on what makes me happy and some of that is a large part of that is making music a, lot, a large part of that is affecting other people's lives with music and another part of that is having the freedom to you know uh visit a family member or a friend if they need me and, and not have financial constra constraints that prevent me from doing that. Mm. Got you. Very, you know, what's, I'm trying to think of the term. I don't know why I can't think of it right now, but it's a term that I, I like to describe you by. What is that term? It's so, it's popular now. Everybody wants to be like this. Uh, there was a emperor, you know what I said about family members that need my mother's calling me right now. Hello? You good. Sorry. Uh yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, um I'm sure you heard this word before. I don't know why it's it's slipping my mind. There's uh, you know that there's like a, a, a I don't know. I don't even know if he was a Roman emperor. Uh, uh Marcus Aurelius, right? He took he wrote these notes, right? Meditations or whatever. What's the term that they relate to all those types of folks? It's not pragmatic. It's like. I'll, I'll take pragmatic. Okay. But that's, that's one of the things. Yeah. I thought about that, but I was trying to think of the other term. Like, and really it comes down to some, 
high self-awareness and focusing on what's in your control. Like really. And that seems to be like you. And part of it is just me saying it out loud so that I can kind of remind myself it's, it's, it's easy to stray away from, from that piece of knowledge. Mm. It's funny you say that. Cause I, that's what I feel like I'm doing a lot of times. Like I'm, I'm saying a lot of stuff to <laughs> that I need to be doing or like reminding myself to do it. So if, if I keep telling people, then like eventually I say, all right, let me make sure I'm parallel to what I'm saying. Yeah. Cause I don't want to get caught by anybody being a hypocrite. So <laughs> it's a good incentive. You kind of put yourself, you paint yourself in a corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Well, if you, based on what I'm hearing as far as your goals, and um, just overall, like long term in the industry, like you're, you're pretty, you keep it pretty simple, right? Um, when it comes to <clears throat> like music, the, to, uh, specifically artists these days, like who are some of the artists that have really impressed you recently, just from a producer standpoint? Like recording artists? Yeah. Oh, man. There's a girl in my city who's, and I'm not using girl as a diminutive, she's actually like a kid, um, named Cece, who's dope. Uh, C, her last name is M-A-R-A-V-I-L-L-A, Maravilla, I think. Yeah, and, okay. So Google that, she's dope. Um, I'm impressed by a lot of the people around me, honestly. I'm, I'm trying to think what music I like to, to, to listen to. I listen to mostly dance hall. Um, Got it. I think Dexter Daps is, is a great artist. Uh, very underrated. Um, who's that guy? Is that white dude from New York that raps? <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible description. Um, damn it, man. What is his name? Uh, shoot. He had this record called Gang. Man, I got to look it up now. He's dope. He can really rap. Um, let me find his name. Who do you like, Sean? What's you said what? Who, who are you impressed by? Oh, man. Um, there was one guy in particular that I just... Well, there, all right, for one, there's um, one dude named Leon. I forgot his last name. Leon Bridges. I, I like his stuff a lot. Um, I wouldn't call him like the newest artist in the world. Who is? Marlon Craft is his name, by the way. Marlon Craft? Marlon Craft. How do you spell that? M-A-R-L-O-N space C-R-A-F-T. Got you. Got you. Oh, and there's another uh, artist I just actually found a couple of weeks ago. Or maybe last week because he commented on one of my videos, but his name is Yellow Pain. Actually, I, I, I'm like enough. Um, y e l l o Pain. He's not that big, like 12,000 subscribers. I mean, sub, sub, subs on Instagram, like 30k on on YouTube. But yeah, he has some pretty, like dope. He has some dope concepts and dope music. I, I definitely think. I don't know what his situation is, but if it's if it's right, he has a lot of potential. Interesting um, guy. But um, yeah, uh, she threw me off with that question. I always, that's like, uh, that question for me is always like movies. Whenever I sit, finally get time to watch a movie, I always forget every movie I said I was gonna watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, let, me, let me see, well, just to, I got two questions to close it out. Cause I'm interested, did you ever want to develop an artist yourself? Yeah, I did do it, but it goes Who back to that. <laughs> I'm not going to say names because it was a it's just a negative experience and I you know that shouldn't define artistry it just it just changed my approach mm. um, it made me want to do that less uh, because you know artist development it's, it's kind of like it's 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 hard to draw lines right because I'm mm -hmm. a creative myself Artist development is heavily creative, but it also has a lot to do with structure and management. So I did have a management deal with at least one artist um, who was a great artist, but 
very difficult to work with. Um, like I said, the, sometimes it's it's like the the greater the artistry, the, the higher the talent level, the the lower the interpersonal. Um, mm. So it was just it was devastating to me as an artist when it everything kind of came to a crashing halt because it was I had invested so much into it and I just wanted to see this this musician win. I really did, and mm. it felt personal because the music is always a little bit personal. Um, but you know, I work, I, I, I think there are a lot, there's so many informal artist development opportunities that don't actually require, you know, a, a traditional kind of management scenario. So like, I've been working with Ted Park since he was in high school. I did his first mixtape. And I kind of look at that as this two way artist development street where you know, we work so closely together. It gives me a chance to really be a producer. Um, but when you're developing a sound with an artist, it's not just you as the producer controlling everything. It's a symbiotic relationship. So mm -hmm. I'm informing him on his process as a songwriter and a recording artist. He's informing me on my process as a beat maker and a producer. And so it's just back and forth, back and forth. We're growing together. So um, the music that we're making now is just i mean when i'm sitting around listening to the music it, that's that that tells you something uh, me and soul are, are finishing up our new project same deal you know, that was that was one of my favorite rappers when i was a teenager and so now we're like four albums in if you're counting eps uh so maybe more than that honestly and and this is this this might be our fifth so that's to me that's development it's just not development with a capital d got you dope <laughs> all right all right so kind of alluding to some of those things you just said though like a lot of artists aren't even in a situation where, where you know you were at where, where you're working actually with somebody and they're having those troubles a lot of artists are having troubles even getting people to work with them at all right to even you know listen to their music at all believe in them in any kind of way what are but so in a lot of situations i'll just preface it with this a lot of artists have a, a bad approach right Certainly. so in the same way you kind of alluded to the producers just like spamming emails are there any like tips that you have that just based off of some things that you've seen like maybe some specific things that you are saying that would be helpful for artists to understand that this isn't just like one person randomly saying oh, I don't like this. This is my opinion. Or these, this is kind of a collective thought of a lot of industry people that I've been around. They do not like how, it, this type of approach and this doesn't work. Well, I think a broad sweeping statement that I can make to address all that is to tell every single artist out there to stop trying to get approval from industry dudes. Hmm. And you always hear it. I'm like, look, stop tagging me in this stuff, please. Well, you you know, you should want to help somebody. You should, you got connections. You got this. No, I don't. And I'm just, I'm in, a, <laughs> I'm in a studio trying to make music just like you. And if I were an A&R for a label, I don't give a damn about you, man. I really don't. If, if I'm in that position, I'm doing my job as an A&R for a label. Get some fans. Nobody cares until you have fans. And then by the time you have fans, you stop caring about all this other stuff. Mm. because your fans are the ones providing a livelihood your fans are the ones energizing you your fans are the ones that you owe your success to they're the ones that are going to take you to that next level some a and r is not going to do that some some verified profile on instagram is not going to do that so stop chasing those people focus on making the best music possible and getting it to the right people you don't make music for everybody. There's a very specific community out there that wants your music, that likes your music, and that likes you as a person and as a brand. You just have to tell your story. And once you tell your story effectively and you continue to do it and you build your brand around it and, it, and, and you do it over a period of years and you're focusing on people who are actually going to stream your music, who are going to show up to your events when you have them, who are going to buy your merchandise, who are going to tell their friends about you, who are going to rep you, who are going to um, interact with you on social media, like your post, boost you up in the algorithm, watch your music videos. Then you're going to see how little a cosign matters. Then you're going to see 
how little uh, a, a radio DJ or a club DJ spinning you once or twice in a, in a year matters. Because trust me, none of it. I've been, I, I was a radio DJ. I am a club DJ. I've been in all those situations. I had the same messed up mentality because it's easy to think that way. It's easy to think that all you have to do is get radio spins and all of a sudden the labels start calling you. It's easy to think that you just get a, a verified check on your Instagram page and you're rich. Trust me, it's, that's not true. Mm. I've done all of that. Um, at the end of the day, it's just you and your fans. If you gotcha. don't have, if you have the fans, nothing else matters. And you, you have to pay attention. You have to treat them like they matter. They can tell if you're not treating them like they matter. If you're just focusing on tweeting DJ Khaled, your SoundCloud link all damn day, you just wasted. Uh, he's not even reading that. But somebody out there might need your, your song right now. They might be at a place in their life right now where they need to hear your song. And they might be at a place in their life right now where they need to feel like you care enough about them to personalize your outreach or to at least tell your story, share your story. The easiest way humans connect is through commonality. So if I go on YouTube right now and say, listen to my record now, I'm not telling the story, I'm being an asshole. But if I go on, on the internet and say, look, this is what I was going through. I was dealing with depression, A, B, and C happened in my life. How many people are going to be able to relate to that? thousands hundreds of thousands millions mm -hmm. now we have a connection people act like this is we're just selling music no we're we're, we're humans humanity that's what <laughs> that's that's the that's the secret you, you can't <laughs> you can't buy that you can't package that it has to, it has to be authentic um people see through that stuff hey man i always say people matter most and you, you try to do all, all these tricks and things like that, but it always leads back to the people at the end of the day. I don't, I don't care what the brand is, the logo is, not like no, it's the people, real people, not not numbers on your social media or nothing. Well, and it's definitely true, and I don't even know why it, it's even a question anymore. And you you had that young man, and you know I I hate that he's in the, in the position that he's in. Um, and I don't know what his situation is if he's if he's facing prison time or what was that that young man who um maybe he's not that young I don't know but he was he was an SEO specialist and he stole for or embezzled four million dollars or something and bought fake views and but oh you know, yeah 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 I heard about that yeah like in Baltimore or Maryland or something like that yeah and it's like let that serve as an example of so many artists say if I just had this money or this amount of followers or this kind of verification badge, my life would be different. Look at him. It's not different. Yeah. 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 And the fact that $4 million went into that. <laughs> $4 million, you know, and that's, and someone out there right now is trying to, to scrounge up $30 to buy fake Spotify plays because they think that's the move and it's not. Someone else, someone had $4 million to spend on that and, you don't know his name, so yeah, it's a tragedy. But we should learn from it, and I and I wish him the best. One hundred percent, man. I think that's a great way to end it. Um, are are there any specific things that you would like people to follow you on? Uh, yeah, follow me everywhere you can. <laughs> DJ, I mean, is it something you promote? You know, yeah, um, I mean, whatever. Nah. Um, <laughs> well, musicentrepreneurclub.com, mectour.com in September 2019. Me, Dame, and Cato are, are hitting the road again. This time we're starting in Atlanta and moving up tour. And I'm going to see you on this tour, right? Hopefully. Uh, Dame told me about the Atlanta date. I got to be at a wedding in San Francisco. So it might be one of the other dates. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll see you on one of the other dates. You heard it first here. He committed. Uh, New York, <laughs> Boston, Philadelphia, D.C. So NBCTour.com, that's where to get the tickets. Um, at DJ Payne one Instagram. Follow me on YouTube. Help me help me reach the hundred thousand mark. That's that's a it's not my primary goal, but I'd like to hit it uh, either way this year. That'd be nice, yo man. You heard that first, man. Follow him, follow him, follow him, follow him. Get those subscribers up, and then you know y'all go find some of y'all friends to help me get to hundred K too. <laughs> yeah, no, do do it both. Do it both. We'll, we'll reciprocate. For sure, for sure. All right, guys. Uh, once again, this video is brought to you by BrandManNetwork.com. And if you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you like, you might as well share. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.
It's the mat work.